Good afternoon, last session. What I thought I'd do is spend some time with you talking about where a STEM education can take you and can take you in places you never imagined. I never imagined I'd be doing what I'm doing today sitting where you are now. Even further in my career, I didn't uh, imagine it. And so I wanna talk about how somebody with a PhD in engineering went from that uh, to other, um, other many careers. So that's where we're gonna go. And we're gonna, I wanna give you some advice along the way as you think about this. So I think about my career going from a PhD in engineering to the Wharton School of Business, to the University of Delaware, to the FBI, to uh, all kinds of careers, and now at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. So let's start at the end. Many of you, I know a couple uh, young people came up to me before we started and said, what is the Federal Reserve and why is a banker here? Well, we're an unusual bank. We're not a normal bank like you go down the street with an ATM machine. We are the nation's bank. So that's what I want to explain. What does that mean? Well, if you look at a dollar bill and you look at the top of a dollar bill, it says, this is a Federal Reserve note, we are money. That's a pretty cool thing. We define what money is for the nation. Not only do we find what money is for the nation, we also set the interest rate for the nation. As Faye said, actually next week we'll have a meeting here in Washington, we meet eight times a year to set the interest rate for the country. And that is a, a very difficult, complex process that involves a lot of economics, a lot of mathematics, a lot of statistics. So we use STEM every single day in making those decisions. We also do a whole variety of other things. We have a large IT shop. We are the nation's bank. So money that flows in and out of the government goes through the Federal Reserve. And so we have a lot of information technology professionals, computer scientists that also work at the Federal Reserve system. All in all, in terms of PhD economists, we probably have well in excess of five, probably closer to 600 PhD economists in the Federal Reserve system. Philadelphia is one of the 12 reserve banks in the country. The 12 reserve banks plus the Board of Governors here in Washington, we comprise the Federal Reserve System. So that's what we do. We make sure the economy stays strong. And not only our economy, but since we're the dominant economy in the world, we try to make sure that the global economy stays strong. Because as you know, the old adage, when the US sneezes, the rest of the world gets a cold. And that's true, so we wanna make sure that the economy is stable and that we fulfill our dual mandate. We have two things that Congress told us we should do. Keep prices low, that is low inflation, and try to maximize employment, make sure every American, if they want a job, can get a job. So that's what the Federal Reserve is. So let's talk a little bit about how I even got here. Right? What, and I think about my career growing up, I don't, I don't know how I got here. I grew up in a blue collar town. Almost nobody in my town went to college. My parents uh, worked hard, they graduated from high school, but my father was a pipe fitter, my uncles were pipe fitters, uh, my brother was a pipe fitter, and I was destined to be a pipe fitter. Being a pipe fitter is a good job, being a pipe fitter and welder is a good job, but it's a hard job. And so my father, when I was young, got sick. And he couldn't work with his tools anymore. He couldn't be a pipe fitter. So he ended up being a draftsman. Now, you don't know what that is today, but it used to be prior to computer graphics and engineering and computer software. Engineers had people who would actually draw the plans by hand to build things. And so he was a very good draftsman to the point where the engineers thought he should go to school and become an engineer, but he was too sick. And he died when I was nine years old. So I went on and I studied and I worked hard. Uh, but I always thought, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be a pipe fitter. And it wasn't until doors opened up to me. And in my case, it was an unusual door that opened up to me that allowed me to get to college. And it was football. I was not only a good student, but I was actually a good football player as well. And that opened the door to the University of Pennsylvania. Yes, that's me, um, with a Fu Manchu and uh, trying to look tough. That's what you did when you were a football player. You tried to look tough. And that got me into uh, the University of Pennsylvania to play football and to study engineering. But my junior year, I got hurt. And when I got hurt, uh, I was hanging around the department, the academic department, and there was a, a secretary 
Shelly Brown, we're still friends to this day. And Shelly said, Pat, you're a bright kid, a hardworking kid, you look bored. I'm gonna set you up with the department chair and I want you to talk to Dr. Lepore about possibly working for him. So I thought, you know, I'm hurt, I can't play anymore. So sure, I'll do that. Dr. Lepore hired me, put me in a lab with one of his doctoral students. I wrote my first paper, academic paper, submitted it to the American Society of Civil Engineers, won a national award, got to go to the meeting, present it. At that moment, I realized, you know, I could do something different with my life. I could be an academic, I could be a professor. I never ever thought that I was able to do that. But somebody, and then I'm gonna come back to this theme, in this case, Shelley Brown, a secretary in the department, saw something in me I didn't see in myself and took a risk on me. Keep that in mind. So, from there, uh, where did we go from here, right? So, what lessons did I learn in this process? I mean, this was the, that was the beginning of my journey. I think that STEM, studying STEM disciplines, whether it's science, engineering, technology, mathematics, does a variety of things for you well beyond the skills and, and, and the perspectives and the knowledge you get from that particular discipline. It gives you superpowers. It gives you powers beyond that. It gives you the ability to see the big picture. It gives you the ability to think creatively outside the box. It gives you the ability and the incredibly important skill to learn how to work in teams. And last and absolutely not least, it gives you a sense of humility, uh, hard work, people call it grit, overcoming adversity, overcoming tough times. It gives you these perspectives because you're going to learn that through the STEM education. I wanna to touch on each one of these for a minute. So let's start with seeing the big picture. So when I was a young engineer, I was um, finishing up my undergraduate degree, and I worked for a company in Philadelphia called Lewis T. Clauder and Associates. And what we did is we designed subway cars and control systems, how to control the cars for railroads, subways, here in the Washington Metro, we did the work here. But we were doing work in New York. Anybody here from New York? Curious? Yeah. So you know the numbered lines of the subway, right? There are two two basic systems, the lettered lines and the number lines. The number lines are called the IRT, the Interborough Rapid Transit System, and I was in charge of the project as a young engineer of redesigning with a team the cars and making them a little longer. Well, when you make them longer, you're gonna hit stuff because the tunnels are narrow, right? So we designed this prototype, and the prototype had, you only needed the ends of the car in the middle because that's the only place that could have possibly hit something, it was all instrumented with electronics, and we literally rode between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. every day, every inch of that part of the New York subway system. By the way, it's really interesting to see New York at 3 in the morning in the subway. You see some interesting stuff. Uh, but we ran this all around the system, and one morning, we are coming into South Ferry Station, and the New Yorkers will know that, where that is. It's the very bottom of Manhattan. And we get stuck. My car hits the walls, of these beautiful mosaic walls in this old station. Now I'm a young engineer, I'm like 20 something years old. I can't call my boss, I mean, A, I don't, there's no cell phones at the time, and only radios, this is in the 80s, and uh, I'm in charge. Finally, the engineer, the guy who drives the train, says in very New Yorkese, look, we gotta go. There's traffic coming down the island, we're going. I said, no, 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 we're gonna, you can't do that. He guns it, and there is tile flying everywhere. I mean, the station is completely destroyed. Now, I'm a 20-some-year-old guy. I have to call my boss and tell him I just destroyed a subway station. And I'm thinking to myself the whole time, what did I miss? I mean, how could I possibly have missed all the calculations into what the radius and the, and the, and the tilt of the track was and everything? How did I screw up so badly. What I learned out of that is I had assumed that the plans I had gotten from somebody else, in this case the Metropolitan Transit Authority, were right. I just assumed that and then I took that as a given to do my calculations. They were wrong and I was wrong. And what I learned out of that is you've got to lift yourself beyond your own work and think of the bigger picture, particularly when you have life and 
property and, and you know, in your hands. I mean, being an engineer, you actually affect people's lives and, and structures and in a very profound way. So that's the one lesson I learned that don't destroy a subway station again. Always make sure whatever somebody's telling you is true, just don't assume it's true. Right? Look at the big picture. Second, let's talk about the next thinking creatively. So when I was actually an engineering student, I worked for a guy named John McGroarty. John was a serial entrepreneur. He had the only convenience store in town. This is well before 7-Elevens hit. He had a farm. He had all kinds of little businesses. Well, I was, the for I was his handyman. I was the foreman on the farm. And this is way before the internet, where he actually had to go to a library to look stuff up. Uh, John shows up one day, he says, and he used to call me Ace. Yo, Ace, the kids want a pool. I'm thinking, okay, an above ground pool, I could do that. He says, no, 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 they want an in ground pool. I thought, go hire somebody, you know, there are companies that do this. He says, no, no, you're an engineering student, you can figure this out. Now, I had a, a moment right there, I could either tell him, are you kidding me? Uh, or I could say, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, and it took a lot of work, but we actually built the pool. Now, I got some help along the way, and that's an important lesson, but time, in, there are gonna be moments in your life where people are gonna challenge you, and you have two options then. One is to say, well, I don't know how to do that, I'll never know how to do that, don't put that on me. Or the other is to say, well, I think I could, let me try that. Now, you can't be crazy about it. You have to know at least something. I knew enough structural engineering and material science to know I could, you know, basic, what the basic properties were, and I spent a lot of time in the library figuring it out. But don't shy away from challenges. That just boosts your creativity. The other thing on a farm, by the way, if, you, if you've never worked on a farm, is uh, it was a pig farm, and uh, pigs are really smart. So you had to be creative about catching them and keeping them in the sty because they often outsmarted you, and that's also part of the humility thing. When the pigs are smarter than you, you know you've got to go back to the drawing board and think even harder and more creatively. Third, what's the, th what's the third thing I learned? Teamwork. There is nothing in science, engineering, that you accomplish on your own. Nothing. You rely on the work that came before you. You rely on the team around you. I learned this lesson in two ways when I worked for the director of the FBI. So when I worked for the director, uh, this is the early 1990s. Uh, I was appointed by uh, President George H.W. Bush to work for Bill Sessions, the director. And he, I was a special assistant in charge of technology policy for him. Now, this is well before CSI, NCIS, it's well before all those technologies. In the old days, when people bad people, bad guys, would get their fingerprints taken, police officers would have to roll the prints with ink. And the way the system worked, they'd take four sets of prints. The best set, the local police department kept. The second best, they sent to the state police department, the, or county police department. The third best, they sent to the state, and the last one, they sent to us, the FBI. Well, you can imagine, if you're a bad guy, you don't like this happening. It's not like you say, oh yes, officer, please let me get my fingerprints done. They're holding their hand down, but we would get this, much, this smudgy mess of ink, and we couldn't tell what was going on. So we had to solve that problem. Uh, and the problem was we had spent a lot of money prior on a lot of technology that just simply didn't work. And this is before all the new technologies called live scan now, where you just scan like a Xerox machine, a copy machine, and get your fingerprints done. That didn't exist. We invented all that during this process. Uh, but in doing that, we had to realize that the problem wasn't technology. For this to work, the states had to work with us. All 50 states and U.S. territories had to work with us collaboratively to make the system work, or n n it wouldn't work at all. It took a, I spent most of my time not on the technology, but on pulling that team together and everybody getting on the same page so that we could get this technology working. Today in Clarksburg, West Virginia, uh, there is the Crime Information Center, which we built as part of this, and it now serves the nation. The second piece of that is, I learned in teamwork was DNA evidence was just showing up. DNA, and it's hard to believe that DNA evidence hasn't been around forever, but it hasn't. The technology has advanced dramatically. And there was a National Academy of Science study that came out 
and said DNA evidence has no statistical validity. Now, what did this mean? It meant anybody, we couldn't use DNA evidence to convict people, particularly crimes against women, often uh, DNA evidence is important. But also, fingerprints had even less statistical validity. So anybody that was convicted of a crime with fingerprints, we'd have to open up the jail and let them out. This is a serious problem for the country. Again, I had to put a team together of people, of scientists, to counter that argument, which eventually won the day in the courts. And now we think of DNA evidence as just commonplace. And it, it, it is important evidence to exonerate people who are, in fact, innocent. It's one of the things that's really important about DNA evidence. Again, teamwork, pulling a team together of people, of experts, and knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know. And this gets to the next uh, two points. So the next point is humility. Knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know. I think to be a good scientist, engineer, mathematician, you need to recognize your strengths and your weaknesses. You need to understand what you know and what you don't know. I learned this early on as a young engineering student. We were supposed to design bridges, and I designed this beautiful bridge. It was exquisite. And then you put it in the testing lab, and then not so good things happen. Now, it wasn't that. That's, that, of course, is the famous Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State, where the wind was hitting it with a certain resonant frequency, and the whole structure just started to vibrate like that. And this is a famous case in nonlinear dynamics. Uh, but my bridge failed, not that spectacularly, but it failed. And something dawned on me at that moment. And it's back to something I said earlier. If this were a real bridge, and I made a mistake, and I didn't reach out to other people, experts in, say, nonlinear dynamics, to help me design that bridge, I could have killed people. I and mean, it was one of these moments in life where I sort of, it, 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 where you just stop. Right? And you can't believe that, wow, this is serious business. I have to get this right. And so having that sense of humility, of knowing you don't know things and reaching out for help, it's OK to do. Many of you in the room are, you see yourselves as very good students. And you are very good students. But you can always use some help. And so what does this mean uh, when the going gets tough? Trust me, the going will always get tough. There's going to be a moment in everybody's education, everybody's career, where you're going to think, I can't do this. This happened to me early on. My freshman year in college, in the dormitory at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, my roommate and I were both on the football team. And the rest of the hallway thought we were dumb jocks, dumb idiots. Right? They, we did, and we were both engineering students. And they really gave us a hard time. And then at that point, I did two things. I only knew how to do things, two things. I was scared. I didn't think I belonged. They told me I didn't belong. They told me, I, how'd you get here? You really don't belong here. I came from a place right, where there, nobody else had gone to college. I did two things, worked harder and reached out for help and asked people to help me. And I think that's how we all overcome the hard times. So where are we today? What does this mean for today? I've had a great career. I've loved the career I've had because of studying STEM disciplines. I get to do cool stuff. I get to work at the Federal Reserve. I get to work with brilliant people, brilliant economists and mathematicians and statisticians. We get to make sure our economy is safe and strong. And I get to meet some cool people. Along the way, I've gotten to meet the Pope. I've gotten to meet Joe Biden. And I even got to fly in Air Force Two a couple times. So this is what I want to leave you with. You will never know where a STEM discipline takes you. I never would imagine when I was in your situation, your seats, I would be doing what I'm doing today. All you have to do is be open to the opportunity, seize the opportunity. Don't be afraid to be challenged and be creative. And just keep following the journey. Thank you.